So thanks to everyone who's here and um, welcome again now in English to um, Zacharias Kunuk and Norman Cohn, uh, who are tuned in to us from uh, Nunavut and Prince Edward Island, as we were talking about before. We have uh, about an hour for a talk, and I'm going to start out asking some questions. Um, and at some point, we'll see if there's any questions coming from the audience. And I'll just a message to the audience. Um, if you would prefer to ask your questions in German, uh, I can summarize them in English uh, for our guests, just damit es weniger Hemmschwelle gibt für den Fall. So uh, we're really happy to have you here uh, as part of this program that's showing a retrospective of the work that you've done together, as well as other examples also from younger filmmakers of, of Inuit cinema from other countries uh, as well as Canada. But what we're gonna focus on uh, tonight is your work, um, uh, particularly um, Zacharias Kunuk's work, and also uh, your collaboration with Norman Cohn. And uh, in our little pre-talk uh, chat before um, you were saying that since you've been working together for so many decades, um, it would take too long to tell the whole, tell the whole story of your collaboration. Um, so we're going to start at a different point. And I'd like to start um, by uh, kind of setting the stage a little bit um, for how uh, Zacharias Kunuk's work uh, came to be. Uh, if I understand right, um, you started out as an artist, as a, a sculptor and a carver. And in the early 1980s, you sold uh, some of your work in order to be able to buy a video camera. And with that video camera, you started documenting people in your community. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about those, those origins, about what, what the move to video or the possibilities of, at the time, those new uh, small video cameras, uh, what, what they meant to you and how you were able to get started in that way? Uh, yes. I was born on the land uh, in 1957. Uh, I came to Igloolik in 1966 to learn English so I could uh, translate for my parents. Uh, in 1966, there was no TV in Igloolik. Uh, so we saw, we went to our little community hall where we watch American films, Cowboys and Indians, uh, John Wayne, and all those cowboy heroes. Um, and we never really understand what film was. Basically, we thought it was God sent. We never knew if there was a camera or so many people worked behind the camera. Um, but it, it, it's entertainment. You just kill two hours of entertainment, and they're right after the sunset. Um, and we knew TV was coming. Uh, it was all around us. In I remember in 1975, uh, the community of Igloolik voted for TV. The majority said no. We don't want it. Uh, and then again, in 79, we tried again, and still our elders said, no, there's nothing. There's nothing in Inuk to do. So again, um, in 1981, I, I was doing, I was going to school. I was doing sculpture so I could go to movies. And I did uh, some big sculptures uh, and I flew down to Montreal uh, dealing with an art gallery and I want a, a video camera since I was interested in still photography and I heard in 1980 that anyone could have a moving picture camera. So I wanted one, I, I wanted one. So I went down to Montreal and got myself a video camera color a portal pack, tripod, I bought myself a TV, 26 inch floor TV, a VCR so I could watch what I'm shooting. But there was still no TV in my little community in the Glulik. So when my equipment came, I was starting a new family and I had my little matchbox house um, and I would 
turn on my TV. Uh, I had some recorded cartoons from Ottawa. A friend of mine recorded for me. Uh, so I put that on in my, turn the TV on, put the cassette on, and I noticed other kids playing outside would be glued to my window. And sometimes I would have a whole bunch of kids sitting on the floor watching TV with me. And so I had this idea, this is the future. Uh, this, these children are gonna watch TV because TV is coming. And I thought, uh, maybe it's better. They're not gonna, they don't listen to us anymore. They wanna look at the box. Maybe it's better to put our teaching through the TV. So they're, they're phasing what they're seeing. So that was the first idea I had, but my camera said color and all I was getting was black and white, and I was filming uh, Easter events, uh, my family uh, outside when the, it get, started to get warmer. Um, that's how I was trying, and people, my other Inuit thought I was crazy, um, trying to act like a Kaluna, like a white person. Um, but then in 1983, I remember in the fall, TV came to Igluik and we watched the first hockey game. Uh, and Inuit broadcasting had started. And here I was trying to film my own subjects. And a friend of mine, Paul Apak, who worked for the Inuit broadcasting, uh, saw me already trying to do what they're tr trying to do, and hire, he hired me as a cameraman. And, and we started in um, editing. We did all. We did it all. I learned more camera work from him, uh, how to edit, uh, how to do sound, how to do light. Um, and then we would try to do a half hour, like 19 minutes a, a week, edited, sent in eight tapes, three quarter inch tapes, and send it out and they have it aired on CBC time slot uh, once a week. Um, but I was noticing uh, I'm interviewing elders of how, what they used to do because uh, we want to know how they used to drive dog team or how they built igloos, uh, how they lived in this uh, cold climate, this land where you don't know what to do, you could freeze to death. Uh, how to survive was basically what we wanted to know. And elders that we interviewed had terrific stories uh, of how they're hunting and how they went through hard times and how they hunted polar bears and how they had a good time and how they got stuck in the blizzard, uh, couldn't go home. And in, in those days that there was hardly telephone uh, in our little community, uh, but two digit number was starting. Um, so when the elders talk, I found it so interesting. It's like watching a film uh, when you tell a story. And I thought, yeah, why don't we film what they're doing? Because my father would come home, sit down at the table after his hunt, drink tea and talk about the hunt they did today and it was so terrific. And I wanted to capture it on video. And I was trying and I didn't know, I never had any training. I never even had camera training. 
so I heard there was a film camera training in the next community. And Norman was going to be the trainer. And I had to, I, I wanted to learn more about the camera. So I went to, I went to Iqalit and I met Norman. And I remember uh, we, there was a whole bunch of us training, but everybody was so busy. Uh, only two of us, Henry and I, were mainly hanging around with Norman. And that's how I met Norman, really Norman. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to jump in just for a second because there's so much to unpack in, in what you've just told us and I'd just like to put some markers of some things that maybe we can get back to afterwards, talking about um, the role of television in your community, also the influence of television and of cinema history on your filmmaking style, uh, the importance of documenting traditions and the oral history stories of the elders and using them for your own work. Um, if television is going to come to your community, then you know you want to help to make the content and not just be consuming the South television that's being beamed in. I think we're going to get back to talking about all those questions. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit from Norman, actually. Um, you grew up in New York, um, at some point moved to Canada. You're now actually a Canadian citizen in the meantime. And what, what brought you to Nunavut? And, and what was your kind of side of the story of how how you started working with um, with Zach and his colleagues? Uh, I discovered video in about 10 years uh, earlier than Zach did. I'm uh, about 10 years older than he is. In very much the same way, self-discovered by accident in a way, uh, unpacking equipment from a box and trying to figure out how to plug it in and trying to make it work. And then once you get it working, you start aiming it around and trying to figure out what is this thing good for? And uh, so I started my life as a freelance video maker in uh, 1970, where the equipment had just been invented like two years earlier. So it wasn't really much of a profession where you could make a living at it. Mm. Um, but I was uh, trying to uh, discover how it could work. And I did some work in schools and with children in daycare and uh, started making portraits of people a little bit like what Zach is talking about, but uh, all of this was, uh, uh, you know, in my culture, first in the U.S. and then in uh, Canada in the early 1980s. And uh, at that time, there was no Inuit broadcasting kind of organization that would hire somebody like me in any North American mainstream media system. Uh, so I ended up drifting into the art world. Uh, my work was not very artistic in the sense of how art schools were experimenting with video in the 1970s or early 80s, but it was artful in a way of looking at how people did things and what, uh, how you could look at uh, the way Zach was looking at his dad or the elders that he was interviewing. And by accident, um, I was in Montreal with a friend of mine and one of Zach's videos was passing through Montreal uh, a trainer with in, Inuit Broadcasting was carrying it from somewhere in northern Quebec to Ottawa. And my friend and I said, can we watch this video before you take it to Ottawa? So we watched a video that uh, Zach had made called Walrus Hunter. And uh, to me, uh, I was working in a way where 
I didn't see anybody else's work that looked like mine, not from video artists, certainly not on television. But Zach's walrus hunter looked like what I was doing. And I thought to myself, well, who is this guy who's at the end of the world? And he's thinking about video the way I'm thinking about video. And I decided I should try to meet him. So uh, I schemed myself into the North. I offered his employer to do some camera workshops specifically hoping that I would meet Zacharias. And um, as fate would have it, they agreed to bring me to a Iqaluit. Uh, Zach happened to choose to come and take the workshop and we actually did meet. And um, in Iqaluit, we uh, realized that we were thinking about video very much the same way from these two completely different cultural backgrounds and uh, actually spent most of the two weeks of that workshop uh, wandering around Iqaluit, which was not his home community and it wasn't mine. And just with the video camera going in and filming things. We went and filmed in the CBC, we filmed in the police station, we filmed in the Anglican church, um, we filmed in the supermarket, uh, in the hotel, and uh, we were just, you know, I would take the camera and Zach would take the camera and it was sort of, I wasn't, I mean, I was sort of the trainer, but and there wasn't anything really for me to teach him except how he could work his video into a future somehow that might not be restricted by Inuit broadcasting. I think it's important to emphasize how new and extraordinary and exceptional all of this was at the time. Not only the fact that the video technology was kind of just starting out and new compared to how it is today, where, you know, we all have it in our telephones, but also um, in, in terms of the content. Um, I know that in 1985, uh, you made a film together um, with the, your two other partners that um, had been mentioned before, Paul Apak and Paluzi um, Kilitalik. Uh, it was a film called, a short video called From Inuk Point of View. And if I understand right, this was the first video uh, made by a, an Inuk person to receive a grant from the Canada Council for the Arts. And it was also a film that um, got a lot of traction that went around in the South, being shown at festivals and on television. And even just from the title, From Inuk Point of View, um, is really very much of a, a program statement about what you were trying to do with your work you know, rather than just um, consuming what was being broadcast on, on Southern television, that you were really coming in and adding your voice to the conversation. Um, how did you realize at the time in 1985 when you were doing this work, how groundbreaking and, and pioneering it was? Well, pioneering is maybe not a good word, but you know what I mean? For me, I didn't know anything about the art world. Um, I didn't even know that you had a project idea that you could propose for funding. I didn't even know, but Norman knew. So that's how Inuit Point of View came to be. And because Southern Point of View is always different to <laughs> our point of view. So, so we came with this title. I, I think Zach knew how groundbreaking it was to express the Inuit point of view in the context of the media world he was confronting at the time. I mean, the 1980s, there were cable television was coming in, there were 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 cable television channels. And you know what they all were the same. They were all like they are now all the same and nothing that showed anything like not just people of color or indigenous people, but the worldview hmm. from the other side of that line. And so when Zach 
had the opportunity to propose his first independent project, what the first thing he wanted to do was, and it's what we've done ever since, is express the fact that there's more than one world view and that people who are not in the mainstream are more aware that there are other ways to see the world. And his culture was a 4,000 year old culture. I mean, when I discovered it, it was an amazing, sophisticated, brilliant, resourceful, complex, uh, oral culture. And to be able to start representing that culture against the colonial stereotype was the, the goal that he and I both shared politically as the right thing for video as a medium to be able uh, to do better than anything that had been available before. But what and I think I would, is so, oh, sorry to interrupt you, go on. I would just say that from an Inuk point of view, from the Inuit point of view is the core concept of our collaboration. Um, and has continued for 36 or seven years in all these films. And if you can really understand how radical that is to actually not just see a film from an Inuit point of view, but really films being made so that that point of view really becomes visible to people who would have no experience of it, not as in a documentary by the National Film Board, but as the real mm -hmm. point of view of the people who are making the film. That's a very radical concept. And um, it's the radical concept we've introduced into the mainstream in the Canadian art world and the Canadian media world, and to a certain extent, worldwide that there's another way of looking not only at the world but there's another way of looking at how these media tools can be used to benefit human beings thank you for expressing that so beautifully it's very important to really understand the the radicality of the message and how important it is for for the for the project as a whole we'll get in a minute to talking about the the worldwide success and the influence that you've had but i'd like to just add one more thought about um the idea of kind of taking what you need from what was existing in the mainstream technologically or in terms of television tradition and making it your own. And uh, this, I guess, will be, first of all, a question for Zach. Uh, in the 1990s, when I was a film student in Toronto, I read an interview with you where you talked about how it was so interesting for you to see how television soap operas were made and how they were beloved by people in your community because um, there could be so much drama and so much going on in the stories, but the people you know, didn't have to leave their house and in a culture where there's a time of year where it's, you know, minus 40 degrees and it's dark all the time, uh, the idea of having, you know, kind of that kind of drama in a, in a sort of like chamber situation, um, that that was very interesting to you at the time. Um, can you talk a little bit about the way that you sort of used influences from the television and the filmmaking of that you watched growing up to kind of, you know, use it for your own work and, and to develop your own voice? It, uh, yeah, when TV came, we started watching soap TV. And one of what we saw was Dallas was great until it ended. But then all my children came and it was really interesting because they're always fighting, always having problems, and they never go out. And here we are up here. We always were more outside than inside. Um, so it was interesting how they did it, uh, how they made it still interesting. And you still want to watch the next episode because what was happening, you want to see, but 
Yeah, they never grow up, but it was interesting. <laughs> That's how I can phrase it. Hila, um, Temana. Human drama. Yeah. Mm. So that the, bringing those two things together, the idea of your the influence that your work had on on world cinema and the question of human drama, I guess brings us to um, we're going to jump ahead a little bit in time. Um, you have now, in the meantime, founded Isuma Productions. The two of you, with the two other gentlemen that we talked about before, Paul Apak and Paluzi Kilitalik, and um, you've already made a TV series uh, called Nunavut Our Land. And now it's um, the turn of the millennium, it's the year 2000, and you have the idea to make uh, a Tanarjuat the fast runner, which is a story that's at least a thousand years old. And it's a story that combines all that kind of soap opera intrigue, also with traditions from the Western that you talked about. Um, it's a film that has shown a couple of times in the program here and is going to be shown again, I think at least one more time uh, before this month program is over. Um, about this young man who gets involved in some love problems, the jealousy, uh, resentment, there's a kind of evil spell that's cast by a shaman figure, um, his community is taken over by violence, and he, there's the legendary scene in the film of the hero Atanarjuat running naked across the ice to get away from uh, his neighbor who's trying to kill him to get revenge. Um, with this film, you were invited to the Cannes Film Festival, um, and I understand this was the first Canadian feature film uh, ever to win the grand prize, the Camarador in Cannes. And it was an extremely influential film for Indigenous cinema worldwide. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that project came to be made and how you developed your version of the, the story of Atanarjuat, which had been like a folk tale uh, in your community for a long time? Yes, when we started filming um, about our culture, because I was so fascinated about our culture, of how they built the igloo. And when I lay down to sleep in, in the igloo and counting the blocks, thinking whoever figured this out must have been genius. Whoever figured the kayak to glide on the sea must have been genius. Who, whoever figured out to hit wild dogs onto a sled and go left and right and go and stop. That those blew my mind. And Atanamjad story is a story that uh, we heard when we were children. Um, it's a long story. It's a bedtime story. And you fall asleep and you want to would tell our mother to rewind back where we fell asleep uh, and continue the story. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, and we were also gearing because we always wanted to do drama and, and, and working for Inuit Broadcasting Corporation. And we, they never allow us to do drama because of their budget. They had shoestring budgets. Uh, they had no room for drama. But drama is what I wanted, we wanted to do because we have these terrific stories. Um, for one, at an Android story, uh, this naked man running out on the ice, uh, which running for his life, naked, uh, just stuck stuck in uh, my mind in, in that story, uh, the revenging story, of, which has all the elements of the film. We wanted to do that. And one of the reasons we wanted to do our first um, film was, our first movie was in 1999, uh, Nunavut was coming. It was going to be carved out of Canada. Uh, the Inuit land claims um, called Nunavut uh, was going to be carved out of the map. And we wanted to come out with a, a movie 
and at an object we started making. And I remember um, we started, I mean, we started and we got, we stopped. I mean, what's wrong? What, what, do, what are we doing wrong? Um, Norman can talk about how, what other problems we had, but, but we, we, was, we were gearing for Nunavut, uh, but we ran into a brick wall and we were just slightly a little late. Uh, 2001, we released it, but not far, uh, two years late, really known. Let me just maybe quickly explain to the audience just um, the 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 idea of the 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 founding of of Nunavut as its own territory. Um, Canada has ten provinces and two territories, and the area where Zach and his community live was part of what was called the Northwest Territories, which is very much a heritage of the colonial situation. And um, there was a move by the people to have part of that land mass become uh, the area of Nunavut, which would they would have their own political self-determination over the area and which they could also have their own political representative sent to parliament. And as, as Zach explained, the idea for this was proposed. It was finally um, kind of agreed upon in 1992. It took some years to organize the, the treaties and the, the um, paperwork around it. And in 1999, officially Nunavut became a territory. So um, two years later, um, you come out with Atanarjuat, which is sort of the commemoration or the statement of um, the autonomy and the self-determination of the Inuit of that region. And Norman has the job of doing the camera in this area where it's full of snow, minus 40 degrees at night, but sometimes extremely sunny. I can imagine that there were a lot of challenges involved in that. Um, would you like to tell us a, a little bit about how it was actually like technically and artistically um, to shoot that film? Um, I think technically and artistically, we just kept developing the same approach that we had started with. That, By that, I mean that I started with when I first unboxed my first camera was the same approach Zach started with when he unboxed his first camera. And it was the same approach that we started with when we did our first short dramas, Hagyuk, Nunakbak, and Saputi, uh, experimenting with recreating real life dramatically because there were no histories written of an oral culture. And so how do you document the past when you have no literary tradition? And what we decided to do was to recreate the past and film it as if it were real. And that became our version of drama. And so we experimented with that with three short films. The Nunavut series was 13 half hours that re created what uh, four Inuit families lived like in the 1940s. And because they were Inuit who have a very strong sense of the culture still alive in their own personal lives, people were able to recreate this 4,000 year old culture in a way that was so realistic that people who saw these films would think they were documentaries. And with Atanajuat, we used to show Atanajuat around the world and occasionally someone in the Q&A would say, is this a documentary? And we would say, you know, there are three murders, a rape, <laughs> a man runs naked across the ice, chased by three guys with spears trying to kill him. How could that be a documentary? <laughs> um, but uh, that style of representation is really the goal of the technical camera side of how we did it. And it's very integrated into 
the medium of video itself where you can shoot for long periods of time without counting off the dollars in your brain. You know, with a film camera, it's very expensive. Every frame costs money. So with a film camera, you press the start button and you're going $100, $200, $300, $400, cut. With a video camera, you can shoot for 30 minutes on a single cassette or eventually an hour on a single cassette. And if you don't like it, you can cover it over and do it over again. So that there was an ability to have a much longer view of things. And that's something Inuit, you know, if you could imagine hunting seals on the ice at 30 below, where you're standing around all day waiting for one seal, and if you catch one seal, your day has been a success. You have a very slow, long view of how time passes. And we introduced that slow, long view, grounded in video and an Inuit way of looking at things into a professional cinema technique. And when we did it with professional equipment, because we got access finally to industrial money. It worked in such a way that audiences were very surprised. And our films don't look like ordinary films. They don't have as many edits. They're not cut up the same way. Things, long shots run for three minutes, five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. Um, but people discovered that they could really see what life was like, even when we were dramatizing it. And so that's really what we've been after, is dramatizing reality so that the Inuit point of view could be real in the world. Hmm. Zach was also mentioning the, the ingenuity within the culture in terms of the building of the igloos, the, the sled, the design of the, the clothing and the, the working with the dogs and, and all those um, achievements. Um, I can imagine that by the time you came to make this film, this wasn't really the way people were living. We've seen it in some of your other work and in your documentaries that people are living in um, other kinds of houses. They have uh, snowmobiles that are powered by engines and, and kind of a lot of those traditions have been sort of forgotten or left on the wayside. How did you actually work with people to be able to recreate a pre-contact world where there are no traces of the you know, uh, settler influence? TV, Zach. Yeah, I guess that would be a question yeah. for Zach. Yeah. Did you have to kind of get yeah. people to learn how to build igloos again and how to make the costumes in the old way and things like that? When I was born, um, my parents were very Christian. They were very Anglican and reading the Bible and the priest telling them to turn away from your old way of life, become new, which they understood, uh, let's throw away these kerbal clothes and go into fabrics. And so we become new. Uh, and they were forbidden to tell stories or sing ayaya songs and drum dance. Um, but um, growing up, I hear our culture, uh, uh, stories and drum dances and this elder uh, in our community, Noah Piwatu, which you probably just saw the film, One Day in the Life of mm -hmm. Noah Piwatu. He stood up and says, our culture is not that all bad. There's some good in it, and that really caught my ear. Um, so, uh, so we started to tell our stories, to start singing our traditional songs and drum dancing, um, and we have to relearn it all over again. Uh, we had to, I mean, and all the 
well, that we did, uh, Norman and I did, uh, uh, we recreate the past because I was noticing, noticing a lot when I was working for Inuit Broadcasting, when I sat down to edit these elder interviews, there, what they talk about is so interesting to see uh, uh, hunting polar bear with dogs. And, and they talk about how their dogs would start to sound different because of the bear. And they unleash their dogs and the dogs run in a corner of the bear so it doesn't go anywhere. And they, all they had to do is run up to catch up and, and there it is. So that's interesting. And I wanted to see that. I wanted to see how it was done. And I tried it a couple of times. I tried filming a dark team while uh, polar bear hunt. And that's quite interesting. It does. The dogs start to sound different. Um, so we're trying all this, trying to make it alive. Uh, it's like you're doing what you're not supposed to do. I mean, we're not even supposed to talk. We're not supposed to be storytellers, but I mean, um, but then we fight back. We're fighting back. We're, today we're fighting back. Um, look at, I mean, we learn about the Ten Commandments: Thou shall not kill, and thou shall not steal. But, but you look very comfortable. <laughs> Is that someone's telephone? <laughs> my brother, take over, Norman. That's the Ten Commandments. Talks about the Ten Commandments and gets a phone call. Is it? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, one of the one of the things. Uh, about when you're talking about camera work and technical stuff. For example, we film things that Zach's talking about, dog teaming, building an igloo, uh, making clothing, um, you know, things that are miracles. I mean, if you've never been there, you could not possibly imagine how anybody could ever catch a seal under eight feet of ice at 40 below mm. with a spear. It's like putting a man on the moon. And yet Inuit were able to do that. How do you create a warm shelter when you have no material except snow? And it works. It's a miracle. Zach's saying he's lying there as a kid and he's saying, who were the geniuses who thought these things up? Well, that's a sustainable culture for like thousands of years. And, and it's a miracle. And so what we realized was, um, well, one time people said to Zach, you know, in the Q&A, why, why do you, why is it so important to have the real igloos or the real clothing? Why can't you use styrofoam? And Zach said, well, when people watch our film 100 years from now, they'll be able to see how we did things. Yeah. And then they'll know how to do it. And that was, I thought that was a remarkable statement because he takes it for granted that people will see our films 100 years from now. And that when they do see our films 100 years from now, they could then go out and build an igloo. And uh, so we filmed these things differently. I mean, if Netflix were filming how to build an igloo, they would do it in 30 seconds, 75 shots cut together quickly, and the igloo would form itself like the old time-lapse photography of a flower opening up in 10 seconds. But we try to show how people really did it, because we're thinking we're sending messages to the future. I mean, future Inuit, if Inuit are still alive 100 years from now and still living in an environment 
and somebody wants to learn how to build an igloo, they can watch our film and figure it out. So there's a couple of different directions we could go in now, and I need to be careful because we, we don't have too much time left. But um, I'd like to get back to the climate change question in the future shortly, because we also have some films about that in the program. But since um, Zach already mentioned it, you mentioned Noah Pugatuk, who is a real person. And most of the people in the audience have just come from seeing a One Day in the Life of Noah Pugatuk. So let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, at the end of the film, we see that it's a real person and that you had done interviews with him uh, in his old age. He's also a figure that comes up in another film of yours, um, which is also being shown in the program. Um, the film, which is called Bowhead Arvik, uh, where they talk about how his wish in his old age to taste whale meat again at a time when whale hunting has been forbid forbidden by the Canadian government, but that will be illegal about that later. Um, but... Uh, um, the, the Noah Pugatuk film is interesting to me because it has also more of a personal connection with your story. It's set in 1961 at the time when a government representative uh, goes into the North and tells the parents that they have to uh, send their children to the notorious residential schools and they themselves have to move from <laughs> their camps into settlements. And this is a movement which is known as forced migration. You also made some documentaries on the subject, including the film Exile. Um, can you sort of tell us how you came to collect Noah Pugatuk's personal story and why you chose to then also tell it? You go back to 1961 when this thing happened and kind of um, re, re, uh, reenact um, that, that period where again, we see the handicrafts and the way that people were living. But at, in the meantime, there's also an influence of um, settler culture with the tea and the sugar and the Bible also, and so on. So the, the idea of, of making a, taking someone whose life you documented in several documentaries and then turning it into a, a drama film. Yeah, one, one thing that uh, we found interesting and one day in the life was that as such a meeting took place. Uh, I heard about this meeting. Uh, they were going out, going out hunting, but this uh, government agent came um, and they had a meeting all day uh, where it was too late to go any hunting. And they just went back. And that's what we tried to show, what was happening. And to make this film, I even sat down with the last people of Kapuivik. Uh, and one, per, one, one man was in that meeting where I had a meeting with these elders before we made this film, where we sat down and asked them, what were they saying? What was the, the government man asking? What was what what was that all about? So from that elder meeting, we found the picture and what was being said. Um, it was time of people moving people off the land into these little refugee communities. Uh, that we are living right now to move us out of the land. It seemed like they told us, get out, get out the land. It's better if you're close to the Hudson Bay Company store or you, you, know, you better well off if you're close to the health center. Uh, it seems like they, they moved us off the land so they could have a free time mining our land. Uh, that's another story, uh, but also in climate change, uh, it was interesting uh, because I was asking the same question, going from community to community, asking the same questions and what the elders were telling me. You know, when I was born, the sun rose from there and it used to sit over there and today I'm noticing it's setting further. And I, that was, that was something. 
that we were even on national news when we were shooting this climate change because uh, what we were noticing, all the scientists coming from the south to check the thermometer up in the Arctic, they, they weren't talking to us. Uh, people who always lived here, uh, I wanted to, uh, I want them to say something. The exile people who, who I interviewed in climate change, I really noticed one man said, you know, when they moved us to the high Arctic, in Resolute Bay, we had, in the wintertime, one hour day glow where we could, can go hunting. And today, at that same time, we have two hours of daylight. That, that is a significant find. And that's what we do. It's like Doing documentaries is like detective work and it's fun to do and you start to find out things and you put it all together. So I have a lot of other questions, but I just want to see if there's any questions from the audience. The audience has been listening very patiently until now. Um, and uh, perhaps some of them have some questions about uh, the Noah Pugatuk film or other aspects of your work. Um, Nicole has... The microphone we don't see you that well but if you just oh now it's we're getting some light in the room that's great thank you uh would anyone like to ask a question or make a comment if not i'll keep going because i have a lot of questions but i want to give the audience the chance yes the microphone's going around to someone now who's going to ask us something yeah, kind of problem. They're going to ask their question in German and then I'll translate it for you. Yeah. Yeah, I thought drin reden. Oh. Yeah, jetzt ist gut. Danke. Um, das ist eine ganz uh, uh, fremde Welt für uh, uns natürlich. Frage an uh, Sack. Uh, Die Tradition Hunt, Hunting, ähm, kann er, ist, sagt ihm das noch was und macht er das noch? Was? Das ist eine sehr gute Frage. Uh, so, he was saying that this is kind of a whole new world that they're discovering through your films. And uh, the question is about hunting. Can you hunt and do you still hunt? Every, every chance I get. Uh, every chance he gets. I so feel Every her chance I get it. Yeah, right now it's minus 30, 35. It's the land just, the sea just froze to the Bavan Island. We love to go there, but right now it's a little too cold. We hunt seals when they're breathing. They have breathing holes under the ice. And, and yeah, that's what we do. We come back bring bring back the food, share it with the community. Um, so elders and whoever wants seal meat, somebody goes on radio and we have seal meat, anybody, they all flock and it's gone. And that's, that's the hunt of the day. That's how we do it. So he it's still hunts and they eat what they hunt, yeah. And just to bring it back to the other question, if I understood right, when you were a little boy, you actually did have the chance to go hunting with the real uh, Noah Pugatuk. Did you also learn hunting from him and from those elders? Um, I, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really remember. Uh, but I remember going out hunting with different uh, hunters. Uh, especially, I remember. Uh, my uncle, because in those days when I was five or six, seven, they we all hunted by dog teams. And my uncle, he, we were, I'm go, he's going out alone, but I'm coming along with him, and we're out there. And he had a tobacco pipe, 
and he lit that pipe and I'm the passenger in the back and I smelled that room and wow, I've never smelled anything like that. <laughs> that was so beautiful. And I never forget that. And some of the hunters, they call their dogs by names and one hunter like calling his, he sings to his dogs um, throughout the hunt. I and mean, I thought that was beautiful uh, because they're scolding and they're sometimes singing and sometimes running beside the sled. And yeah, they do all sorts of things. So there's another question yeah. that I'd like to ask you about uh, because uh, of a film that's being shown in the program, your film uh, Searchers, which is in, and it was also a collaboration between the two of you. Um, it's a film that was inspired by the John Ford Western, The Searchers from 1956 with John Wayne. And uh, the original Searchers was also shown in the program as a reference to your work. Um, and it's actually a, like a very shockingly racist film that's very much on the side of the white people trying to commit genocide against the, as they called them at the time, Indians, the indigenous people of North America. I'm so curious about your choice of that subject matter as an inspiration for your own film, which then becomes a story of a kind of like a fight between good and evil, but without um, the fight between different um, ethnic groups. Why why a film based on this notoriously anti-Indigenous film tradition? When we went to watch cowboys and Indian movies, they always had 30-30 rifles. And in our in our culture, when gun was introduced, it was very, bullets were very scarce uh, in our film there's only three bullets in the film and he's against four, four, uh, four men. Uh, and he goes hunting and he shoots two caribou with one shot. Uh, now he's down to, uh, no, he had four bullets. Now he's down to three. Um, so in sort of, the, sort of the idea of the cowboy um, the chase, like they're in, in the cowboys when they're chasing, they're always galloping with their horses all the time. Uh, um, and, and in our film, searches, we they were racing away from who's ever coming. They know that it's the husband that's coming. Um, and John Wayne, I've seen searches. I mean, it's not the same. I mean, <laughs> you know how many colors of shirt he wears? And he changes his hat, black and white all the time. I couldn't understand that because in, when we make film, we're so concerned about continuity. Uh, even we take pictures when we take a break. So if somebody moves a thing, we move it back. Uh, but these guys, they didn't care about color, the color of the shirt he wore or the color of the hat he wore. They didn't, didn't churches didn't care about that. But it was, the idea was using, using the 30-30 rifle and the chase. Uh, uh, remind me of uh, John Wayne movie, um, so that that's what we what we did differently. But our style, you know, kidded style, uh, where in our stories uh, they're kidnapping women uh, um, in churches in John Wayne. They they kidnap a woman too. Uh, yeah, it's some something like that. Norman, would you like to comment on this as well? Because if I read my research correctly, you were also involved in the concept for uh, the Inuit version of Searchers. Well, Zach used to talk about when he was a teenager and he would see John Wayne movies in the community hall. 
and he would identify with the cavalry and the cavalry would go out and they would find the patrol that was ambushed by the Indians with arrows sticking out of them. And John Wayne would say, what kind of savages would do something like this? And Zach would say, well, you know, we were thought we were going to, we were like on John Wayne's team. And after a while, he grew up a little bit and he realized that there are two sides to that story. Mm. And that, uh, you know, the idea of the representation in these films of the people that are more like him, that they were the savages. And uh, to uh, be able to see the other side of that colonized media view and make films that represented uh, the, the indigenous people, Inuit, the people Zach grew up with as human beings and human beings as complex and emotional and concerned and intelligent and skillful as uh, the people who in John Wayne's movies are hunting them down and trying to kill them like animals. Mm. Um, you know, we're not talking about the theme of colonialism in this uh, hour very <laughs> much directly, mm -hmm. but it's the fact of life that contextualizes everything we've done with media because the colonialism is still around. It's still active. There's still, we've just defeated a mining company from expanding and all over Baffin Island through the intervention of media. Um, but Zach's whole approach to video was formed by reacting first to and then against the story in the John Wayne films that he and his family and his parents and his respected elders were savages. And when Noah Piagatuk, one day in the life of Noah Piagatuk, we decided to dramatize the conversation and let people decide mm -hmm. for themselves who's a savage mm. and who's not a savage. Yeah, that's very well put. Let me see if there's any question, last question from the audience before I ask my last question, because we're actually coming to the end of our time. Oh, there is another question. Okay. Yep. I have a question uh, for Zach. Uh, it's about uh, his background, his literal background in the room you are in right now. If I see that correctly, these are all videotapes. Can you tell us about those? What collection mm -hmm. is that? <laughs> okay, what are yeah, these tapes uh, that are behind you in, that, in your room? That's a great question. That is a good question, thank you. <laughs> How many more uh, hours do we need? <laughs> <laughs> when, I went, when I went to internet broadcasting, uh, this is the place where we went to work, but when after uh, Inuit Broadcasting closed their office here in Iglili, and I wrote to the, their director, I, I want this place. Uh, they basically gave it to me and they were gonna throw away all these old tapes and all the old equipment that we grew up with since they they're, they're closing this office down and that's why i used them as background they're still here there are three quarter inch tapes the original tapes and someday um when, when i pass through them there's no appeal that to they're talking and some other Hunters talking about uh, whale hunts, seal hunts, walrus hunts, caribou hunts, uh, wolf hunts, and building igloos. Uh, yeah, storytelling, it's all there. 
So we're going to save it someday. So that's a great question because it's a bridge to something that I actually wanted to ask. So we heard you're in the premises of the former Inuit Broadcasting Company, which doesn't exist in that form anymore, but we're now living in the internet age and people are streaming films. You also, your uh, production company Isuma is also related to Isuma TV, which is an online streaming service for Indigenous films. How do you see the future of film watching do you are you yourself kind of producing more for the streaming world or trying to get more organized um for using the online resources to to distribute your work i don't know how many more years i will go i'm in my elderhood but i'm learning uh, about this new technology internet it's usually very slow up here in the Canadian Arctic, but more and more it's improving. And now we have Starlight. Starlight satellite that we're getting. Is that a satellite communication? <laughs> yeah, it's a new yeah. thing that we're, we're having now, which we hook up to the global satellites where we have faster internet. internet. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the future uh <laughs> yeah, maybe we can add nature. something to that oh, sorry to interrupt you i just wanted to add a little detail that i forgot to mention before um in 2019 when the noah pugatuk film was made uh zach and his team were also invited to be the canadian contribution to the biennale in venice and one of the things that they did was they set up a webcam so that people in venice or actually anywhere on the internet could watch them hunting uh, with um, in the, on the ice, and the project was called Silakut Live from the Flow Edge. Silakut means moving through the air, so that's like a, another word for kind of transmission or broadcasting. Um, so, just to say that the, the the options that are provided by the web cameras and by streaming are, are broader than than we might think. It, yeah, uh, one of when we had a show in Venice, that's how I wanted to present uh, our, our artistic work is to present it from where we are, halfway around the world, live, and talk to people and show them what we do. Uh, it was interesting that we're playing with technology. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, it's mind bro blowing. Uh, yeah, it's man. It's we came from the land. We, I thought when I was five years old, we were the only people on earth, but they were already flying airplanes. Uh, when I went to school and learned about Africa in my shows of studies learn about elephants, giraffes, and monkeys, that animals that I will never hunt in my life. Uh, but I learned, uh, took it from there. Mm. Never look back is the theme. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we have to come to an end, but um, we have a couple of films that are showing in the program here that are also on the question of <laughs> climate change, most notably a film called Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. And that's gonna be screening here on um, February 2nd uh, in a program with that's also gonna be introduced um, by an expert. Um, can you, uh, Norman, you also mentioned um, the, the fight against the mining companies and the, the threat of the kind of fossil fuel industry and some other things that are going on in the North. Um, would you like to each give us a kind of final statement to let us know what's happening uh, on that topic right now or how what your hope is for how things will go in the future? Yeah, we, we are really noticing the climate change up here. Um, I remember a few years back in the new year where we start firing up. Uh, in the new year, it used to be so cold and it's steaming cold. 
like steaming cold, it's cold, cold, like minus 40, 40, 45, but wind chair factor is more. Uh, but this year we went only up to 30. Now after New Year's where sun is coming back, it's gonna start getting colder. We're now hovering 30, 34, 35. We're not even reaching 40. So yeah, it is really happening. And in the springtime, when we go out hunting to our traditional places, we have to get off the ice because the ice is too thin. We, uh, we, we can really notice it. It's the thin, the ice, thinning of the ice. It's like the global warming is coming from the sea. <laughs> That's how it feels like up here. Yeah, Norman, would you like to add something to that? Um, you know, uh, the Arctic is like the canary in the coal mine. It's whatever's happening in the Arctic is what's going to happen in the rest of the world next. Uh, global warming is uh, changing uh, how people can live and uh, people have to adapt. And Inuit have specialized in adaptation. It's one of their 10 commandments is be resourceful and adapt to changing circumstances. So listening to what Inuit have to say about mining, about pollution, about wildlife, about climate is, or not listening, is like not listening to the canary in the coal mine. Mm. And, um, you know, our films, what Zach is trying to do with media, with television, what we've been experimenting, you know, the, the videos behind Zach are like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're the Inuit culture, the scraps of recorded material that could never be replaced or found again. But at the same time, our team is experimenting with the furthest edge of the technology going forward, which is being able to broadcast live from the most remote wilderness on earth and try to communicate to the rest of the world uh, what the future is going to be like. We take that as the last word or would Zach, would you like to add one last, last word to that? Please. Well, right it's now, the future. Think, uh, What's your yeah, future? Right, right now, uh, I'm carrying an iPod, iPhone 13, which has 4K and it could shoot 24 frames a second <laughs> in my hand, in everybody's hand. And I just went to Greenland and I just shot with this iPhone. Uh, 4K and I'm shooting, 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 and I've edited it down to almost an hour, just finishing. And what you, it's amazing what you can do now. And anybody with that little thing in your hand, and it's, it's everything, it's everything. You play games with it, you talk with it on the phone, you film with it, it's everything. What do we ever want to? Well, we look forward to seeing your next film. Uh, people who want to follow the work of Izuma can go to their website, also look at Izuma Television. There's also an online book that can be downloaded about the production of uh, Noah Pugatuk and also the work that they did in Venice with the streaming of the hunting. Um, at this point, I would like to just remind everybody that uh, we have two other special events in the program on February 2nd, Vale und Wetter, which is the combination of films about um, climate change and uh, ecology. And also on February 6th, uh, with the film Uvanga, there's supposed to be a talk 
which we hope will take place. Maybe Nicole can say something about that in her closing remarks. And before I give Nicole the very last word, um, I'd like to thank you both so much um, for the work that you do and for taking the time to speak to us through this wonderful medium of Zoom. And also thanks to the audience for your attention and for um, participating in this event. And thanks to everybody. And now, Nicole, would you like to come to the front? Yes. <laughs> Um, dear Zacharias and dear, oops, we have Norman and dear Zacharias and of course dear Marcy, thank you so much for this very generous and insightful talk. We are very much looking forward to what comes next from you and we are very much hoping that the world listens to what you need to have to say about our world. So, um, yeah, thank you very much both and um, hope to see you soon, some way or the other. Thank you, everybody, thank you. and I hope you enjoy the films. And also thanks to the technician for making everything work so perfectly. Thank you, Nora. <laughs>